Good morning, church. Um, so thankful for us to be able to worship God um, through music this morning. What a privilege for us to praise and worship um, God, our Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. So thankful that we have the opportunity to do that. In fact, the scripture we're going to be looking at today, Nehemiah chapter 9, is really this big praise service. It's a time of repentance and prayer. It's a praising God. And we just got to do that through worship, um, through music this morning. And we are also now are going to get to worship God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. So I'd encourage you, you can give online through our website. You can give online through our app. Or you can mail in your tithes and offerings to the church. Would really hope and appreciate that we can continue to give to the Lord during this time. And so at this time, you can go ahead and worship through giving. So we worship through music. We're going to worship through giving. And we're also going to worship through the studying of God's Word this morning. We're still in the book of Nehemiah. So if you want to turn to Nehemiah chapter 9, just as a reminder of where we've been, where we're going The book of Nehemiah is focused on this guy who, a regular guy in a regular job, who is the cupbearer for the king of Persia, and God impressed on his heart that he needed to go back to Jerusalem. He was an Israelite, go back home and rebuild the walls of the city so that people might move back into the city. They might worship God and bring him honor and glory. And so the first half of the book of Nehemiah is all about that building project of rebuilding the walls. But there was a transition that happened that we just looked at a few weeks ago. They finished rebuilding the walls, and now they've focused on renewing the covenant with God. Last week, we talked about how they celebrated the festival of booths, how they were reading through God's Word, said, we need to celebrate this feast. And so they went out and they did it. They were remembered God's word. They celebrated what God had done. They were responding to God's word. And as we read God's word together, as God commands us to do different things in scripture, those things are not optional. We're required to obey God's word. So we don't want to be just hearers of God's word, but we want to be doers. And that's what we looked at last week. We got to end by celebrating communion with one another Now we're going to enter into a time in Nehemiah 9 where the Israelites gather back together for a time of repentance and prayer as they truly are gripped by the greatness of God. So my friend Becca is going to read to us from Nehemiah chapter 9 this morning. Nehemiah 9, 1 through 21. On the 24th day of this month, The Israelites assembled. They were fasting, wearing sackcloth, and had put dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent separated themselves from all foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their ancestors. While they stood in their places, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day, and spent another fourth of the day in confession and worship of the Lord their God. Jeshua, Bani, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Chenani stood on the raised platform built for the Levites and cried out loudly to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hodai, Shebaniah, and Paneah said, Stand up. Blessed be the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens and the highest heavens with all their stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and all the stars of heaven worship you. You, the Lord, are the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and changed his name to Abraham. You found his heart faithful in your sight and made a covenant with him to give him the land of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have fulfilled your promise. 
for you are righteous. You saw the oppression of our ancestors in Egypt and heard their cry at the Red Sea. You performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, all his officials, and all the people of his land. For you, for you knew how arrogantly they treated our ancestors. You made a name for yourself that endures to this day. You divided the sea before them, and they crossed through it on dry ground. You hurled their pursuers into the depths like a stone into raging water. You led them with a pillar of cloud by day and with a pillar of fire by night to illuminate the way they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. You gave them impartial ordinances, reliable instructions, and good statutes and commands. You revealed your holy Sabbath to them and gave them commands, statutes, and instructions through your servant Moses. You provided bread from heaven for their hunger, and you brought them water from the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land you had sworn to give them. But our ancestors acted arrogantly. They became stiff-necked and did not listen to your commands. They refused to listen and did not remember your wonders you performed among them. They became stiff-necked and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love, and you did not abandon them. Even after they had cast an image of a calf for themselves and said, This is your God who brought you out of Egypt, and they had committed terrible blasphemies. You did not abandon them in the wilderness because of your great compassion. During the day, the pillar of cloud never turned away from them, guiding them on their journey. And during the night, the pillar of fire illuminated the way they should go. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold manna from their mouths, and you gave them water for their thirst. You provided for them in the wilderness forty years, and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. Thank you, Becca, for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we love you. We're so thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather together and worship you this morning. God, I pray that we would be a people or that emulate what the Israelites did, what Becca just read, or that we would be a church or that confesses sin, that repents to you where we need to repent, where we fall short, Lord, that we'd confess and be open about that. But God, also that we would seek your face in prayer, that corporately, God, we would be a praying church. And Lord, we pray for the next few moments as we study your word, Lord, that your spirit would be at work, Lord, that you'd turn our hearts to you, Lord, that you would speak, Lord, we would listen and we would act. We thank you for your word, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So Becca just read how they gathered together and they had a time of repentance. They put on sackcloth and ashes, dust on their heads, they're fasting, and they are truly sorry. And you know, repentance is something that we oftentimes I think don't really have a good grip on as a church, as a society. It's really easy to say you're sorry, but repentance is actually turning away and moving on from those sins that you have been falling into. And so we'd like to give you guys just this little picture of what is the difference between lip service and true repentance. Hey, beautiful. Hey. Oh, you still have that thing on your face? Isn't it wonderful and manly? Gross. Please shave it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hey, beautiful. It's still there. I said I was sorry. What What more do you want? Hey, beautiful. 
the face I love. Thanks. Anything for you. Well, I don't know about you, but I think I deserve an Emmy, an Academy Award, something for that performance right there. And in fact, I just think we need some sort of trophy for that beautiful mustache that is now gone. We want to remember that and remember it well. That was the quarantine stash of 2020. Maybe I'll get another one someday. You know, by the end of that week or so that I had the mustache, Avi was just playing with it, and she loved it. So I feel like Jill needs to get on board. But regardless, you saw, like, that. I know that was humorous. Yes, it's cheesy. We're trying to have some fun with it. But the idea is, if you just say you're sorry, but you don't actually change your actions, change your attitude, it's just lip service. And what the Israelites had done is, remember, they had been hearing God's word read to them in chapter 8. And so they started repenting. Then Nehemiah said, no, let's celebrate. Let's praise God. And so they're praising God. They go and they celebrate the festival of booths. But as they're reading through God's word together as a people, they realize again, God is so incredible and so great, and he requires these things of us, and we have not been meeting the standards that God would have for us. Because God is so great, when we don't meet those standards, God requires repentance. And really, as we understand God's greatness, it should lead us to repentance. Really, God's greatness leads to repentance. And we see that's exactly what they are doing. They gather together in an assembly. They separated themselves from foreigners. They stood and they confessed their sins. And look at this. Not just their sins, but the iniquities of their fathers. Why the sackcloth, the fasting, the the dust, the ashes on their head? Those are all physical pictures of the inner change that they believe has to happen in their own lives. We talked about this last week, but it's God's word works as a mirror in our hearts. And this mirror worked for the Israelites, so it went ahead and this mirror exposed the Israelites' sin. As they read through God's word together, they realized they were not measuring up. And they realized it wasn't just them. It was their father's. So what do they do? They gather together and they confessed their sin. They gather together and they confessed their sin. Look what it says. While they stood in their places, verse 3, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day, and they spent another fourth of the day in confession and worship of the Lord their God. If you think of their day, they'd really broken up their day Uh, that they're up and and around for 12 hours. So for three hours, they're reading God's word. Another three hours, they are confessing their sin. Confession becomes a part of worship for them. And understand this, this was both individual and communal confession. It was individual and it was communal confession. Confession. We can become such an individualistic society where we gather together to worship and yet we feel distant and apart and we want to only take responsibility for ourselves. We don't want to let anyone else affect us. And yet what the Israelites model for us, and this is something, church, we have to understand. We are all one body. When one part sins, we should all repent. When one part suffers, we should all suffer with them. When one part has joy, we should have joy as well. And what is really great that the Israelites model for us is this idea of confessing the sins of their Fathers, confessing the sins of their community. Church, 
when we haven't been as compassionate as we need to be, when we haven't helped the least of these like we should, we as a church need to confess. When we've sinned and been in error, we need to lead the way in confession. You know, I think really when you talk to non-believers about what's turned them off from the church, the number one thing that I hear is that we are hypocrites, that we're hypocrites. Now, I believe that's not because we sin. We all sin, right? But I believe it's because we don't confess and repent publicly of those sins. If we're up here and we're banging the pulpit about the sins of the world, but we never address the sins that are in our own hearts. There's an issue with that, and that's what turns off, I believe, the lost world around us. They're not expecting for us to be perfect, but they do want us to be honest when we mess up. And I think if we follow the example of the Israelites here in Nehemiah chapter 9, I think it'd do a long way for us connecting with the lost world around us. You see, they start off praying and focusing on God, crying out loudly to him. It says that they, they gather together, they ask for us to stand up to be blessed by God from everlasting to everlasting, it says in verse 5. And they go into this blessing time. See, God is great. And God's greatness should lead us to repentance, and we don't measure up to that great, perfect standard. But God's greatness should also lead us to worship Him. It should lead us to prayer. God's greatness leads to prayer, and that's exactly what they do here. They gather together. They ask everyone to stand up. They start to bless God's name from everlasting to everlasting, And they go into this prayer of blessing. And what we see here in Nehemiah is outside of the book of Psalms, this is the longest continual prayer in the Old Testament. The longest continual prayer in the Old Testament outside of the Psalms. And what we see here as we get into this prayer, as Becca read for us really the first half of the prayer What we see is this is a summary of the Old Testament. What scholars say is this is the fullest summary of the Old Testament in the entire Old Testament. If you want to get a good, simple picture of what all the Old Testament entails, you can read Nehemiah chapter 9. Just read this prayer and you'll see a summary of the Old Testament. This prayer begins with creation, and it goes all the way through the exile. It begins with creation. It goes all the way through the exile. Look at verse 6. It says, you, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens with all the stars, the earth and all that's in it. The seas, all that's in them, you give life to all of them, and all the stars of heaven worship you. This is a simple summary of Genesis 1 and 2. God is our creator. So we see this prayer is theologically grounded. It's starting at the beginning of the Old Testament. And acknowledging God is our creator. God is the one who gives life. It continues on. And then in verse 7 we see it goes into Abraham's call. That God chose Abram, brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans, changed his name to Abraham, found his heart faithful, and made a covenant with him. So this starts Genesis, really, 11, 12, goes on Genesis 15, some Genesis 17, all right here packed in these verses, 7 and 8. God makes a covenant with Abraham. We all know these Israelites gathered together here in Jerusalem with Nehemiah. As they're gathered together, they're all descendants of Abraham, part of these promised people. Look what it says in verse 8. I love it continues to bring us back to God. God is the center of this prayer. You have fulfilled your promise. You are righteous. 
Do you see how they're acknowledging God's greatness even in this prayer? We're talking about the goodness of God. The greatness of God. Acknowledging God has fulfilled his promises. The reason why these walls were destroyed, they had to come back and rebuild. And the reason why the people were scattered, the reason why they were in exile had nothing to do with God. It had everything to do with them and their own sin. God has always fulfilled his promises. And he's done it now by bringing those who are scattered back from exile. And then in verse 9 through 21, we have this very long prayer, that, a very long portion of the prayer that deals all with the exodus and the wandering in the wilderness. All the way from, again, verse 9 through verse 21, it's all about the exodus and the wilderness wandering. And we'll see a contrast here. Listen to this. Look at this even as an example, verses 15 and 16. Let's contrast as they're praying, how God was compared with how the people were. Verse 15, it says, You provided from hev- bread from heaven for their hunger. You brought them water from the rock for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land you'd sworn to give them. God, you're a provider. You gave bread. You gave water. You sustained your people. You promised them this land flowing with milk and honey that they could go and take. But look at the contrast, verse 16. But our ancestors acted arrogantly. They became stiff-necked and did not listen to your commands. We see this throughout the prayer, and we really see this cycle throughout the Old Testament. God is faithful, and God is good. And he provides for his people, and his people, instead of worshiping him like they should, they turn their back on God and do what is right in their own eyes. This is a pattern picked up by those that are praying. You can see as they're confessing, they're confessing, saying, God, you've been so good, and let us repent, because time and time again, we've turned away. If we can all be honest with ourselves, this is the story of all of our lives, right? God has been so good. God sent his son to die on the cross to give us eternal life. God is so gracious and merciful and kind, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And yet many times we choose to turn away from him and do what is right in our own eyes. And these, this prayer shows all about Exodus and the wilderness wandering. And then it goes on in verse 22 through, through 25. We see that they talk about the conquest, the book of Joshua happening here where God gave them kingdoms and peoples and established boundaries for them. So you see they're praying through the Old Testament. It's this time of conquest. They subdued the Canaanites as they captured fortified cities. Verse 25 says they ate and were filled. They became prosperous. They delighted in God's great goodness. If only it ended right there, but look at the contrast, the flip to verse 26. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. We see really verses 26 through 28. It's all about the rebellion, and we see this leaning into the book of Judges. Where the Israelites turned from God and did what was right in their own eyes. And verse 28 shows, as soon as they had relief, they did again that what was evil. You abandoned them to the power of their enemies who dominated them. When they cried out to you again, when you heard from heaven and rescued them many times in your compassion, God would save them. Then they'd forget and they'd fall uh, into oppression because they were, they had abandoned God. They'd cry out to him. He'd save them. This is a cycle throughout all of the Old Testament. And the prayer lays it out. Again, God is so great and we just can't seem to get it right. Verses 29 and 30 unpack the time of the kings and the prophets and the time that they go into exile. See what it says in verses 30 and 31? Excuse me, in verse 30, you are patient with them for many years, and your spirit warned them through your prophets, but they would not Listen, therefore, you handed them over to the surrounding peoples. However, 
in your abundant compassion, you did not destroy them or abandon them. Why? You're a gracious and compassionate God. Though they were so disobedient that eventually they were taken into exile, into Babylon, God did not forget his people. They unpacked this whole long prayer, just really unpacking the entire history of the world up to this point. It's an incredible prayer in its breadth and its depth. And then it hinges here on verse 32. It says, so now our God, the great, mighty, awe-inspiring God, they turn and now they're going to cry out to God for help. But what we see throughout this prayer, before we dive into that right now, I think it's really interesting. There are many times, and I've had many conversations with people who just say, Zach, I'm not sure how to pray. I'm not sure what I should pray. Sometimes I just struggle staying focused when I pray. What Nehemiah 9 does, it gives us this incredible model for ways to always be able to pray and never run out of what to pray. And you see what they do? They pray scripture. When you aren't sure what to pray, you can always pray scripture. In fact, I'd encourage you as you read through scripture daily, if you're reading through the book of Acts with us together, if a verse pops up, underline that thing and then you just pray that to God. If we read this passage in Nehemiah 9 and we see that they are repentant and they're Put it on sackcloth as they're praying to God and crying out, confessing forgiveness. Use that as a model. I just read Nehemiah, Lord. I know I need to confess to you that I've messed up, that I've sinned, that I've fallen short. God, I want to confess just like the Israelites did in Nehemiah 9. You can always pray Scripture. Sometimes we want to get so creative in how we pray. We want to do this. We want to do that. Well, you want to make sure your prayer is... Um, theologically grounded, is biblically um, sure and secure, well, just go to God's Word and pray His Word. That's what they do. They unpack it all, say, God, we've messed up, but you've been so good. And then they turn to this big ask. And what do they say? They're asking for God to be gracious on them. They lay it out and they say, God, you're good, you're mighty, you're awe-inspiring. God, you keep your covenants. And they say this in verse 32, do not view lightly the hardships that they have afflicted on us. God, you've acted faithfully when we've acted wickedly, but God, we need your grace. God's greatness is seen in his grace. What we see throughout this entire prayer is that God doesn't treat his people as we deserve. God doesn't treat his people as we deserve. He extends grace. The Israelites, throughout this prayer, they show God's mercy throughout history. God was merciful again and again and again and again. And now what they're asking him is they're saying, God, do it again. Here's what I love. Whenever we feel like we're struggling, whenever we're like, God, I don't know if I can handle this. God, I don't know if I deserve this. What I love is that God's past actions are such a great indication of what he's going to do in the future. And we see as they unpack this history of the Old Testament, really history of the world up to that point, what we see is God is gracious and merciful and kind again and again and again. So when we ask for God for grace and mercy, we're just saying, God, do it again. God, we've seen your grace, your mercy, your favor, your love shown to your people over and over again. God, for us on this side of the cross, we look back to the cross and we see God's incredible grace for us. So we just ask God, do it again. 
They admit they are in distress and that they need God. Guys, can we be honest? I know about you, this is the first global pandemic I've ever lived through. Times are interesting right now. We're in some distress. And you know what? I think we need to model what the Israelites do. Say, God, it's hard right now. Look how it ends in verse 37. They're saying, God, you've set these kings over us because of our sins. It's our fault that we're here, God. The world is broken because of our sin. We know that, God. They're saying they rule over our bodies, our livestock as they please. And look how it ends, this prayer ends. We are in great distress. Yeah, a global pandemic, I think we can echo that right now. God, we are in great distress. We need you. We need you. It is always appropriate to pray to God how much we need him. Say, we're in great distress. God, we need you to work. And look at what they do to show that they're serious. Verse 38, this is how the chapter ends. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement in writing on a sealed document containing the names of our leaders, the Levites and the priests. They end their time of worship by making a covenant. They end their time of worship by making a covenant. What they're saying is, God, we want to show you that we're serious. We're making this commitment. We're going to cut this covenant saying that we are your people. Now we understand without the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we can never live up to God's standard. But what we can do is we can pray to God and say, God, I need you. God, I surrender to you. God, I want to make a covenant with you. My life is no longer my own. I know I was bought with the price. Your son died on the cross for me, so come fill my heart. God, let your spirit rule over me. I want to make a covenant with you that I'm no longer going to try to do things on my own, but I'm going to surrender to you. So let me just ask you, what kind of commitment do you need to make to God today? God, I'm going to spend time in your word each and every day. I want to be able to, in my prayer time, be able to pray all the Bible like they did in Nehemiah because I'm just so saturated with your word. God, I'm going to spend time in it each and every day. God, I'm going to go to my family who I know I've wronged, and I'm going to confess and repent like they modeled for me here. God, I'm going to make a commitment whenever we can gather back together as a people. I'm going to be there. I'm going to stop prioritizing other things over the meeting of your people. I don't know what kind of commitment you need to make, but I do know this passage models for us that we need to repent and we need to make covenants and turn to God and say, I'm going to make changes in my life. You know, I think it's really interesting. This, if you go back to verse one, and this is really where, where we will end. It says this in verse one, it says, on the 24th day of this month, the Israelites assembled. Now scholars look at that and they believe that the 24th day of that month would have been October 31st, 445 B.C. October 31st, 445 B.C. That's a pretty interesting date. And no, you pagans, not because it's Halloween, okay? October 31st is when the Protestant Reformation started. So in almost 2,000 years, really, to be exact, 1,952 years later, Martin Luther would nail the 95 Theses onto the door at um, Wittenberg, October 31st, 1517. And I want you to listen to this. This is how 
the Protestant Reformation started. The number one thesis that he put on this list, these 95 nailed to the door, it was this. The first thesis says this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Don't you love that? This is how the Protestant Reformation started. Martin Luther said, listen, the entire life of a believer should be one of repentance. Guys, we need to get comfortable going to God and confessing and repenting and asking him to change our hearts and change our direction. Almost 2,000 years apart, we saw these changes happen. We saw repentance with a revival in Nehemiah. Then we see repentance is what kicks off the Protestant Reformation. Well, now it's been 503 years since Luther nailed those um, 95 theses to the wall, and we still need to repent. I believe that another great awakening could happen in our country, in our world, if we would repent. The entire life of believers should be one of repentance. What do you need to repent of this morning? What do you need to give to God so you might live more fully for him? And if you're listening to us, watching us for the first time today, or you're watching us and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, Jesus says in order to follow him, you have to do two things. You have to repent and believe. You repent, you acknowledge that you are a sinner, that you've messed up, that you cannot be in right relationship with God on your own. You turn from those ways. You stop trying to do things on your own. And you believe in the truth of the gospel. You see, we can never be good enough. The reason why we have to repent all the time is because we mess up all the time. We need the gospel every day, but the good news of the gospel is that Jesus was perfect where we cannot be perfect. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So you just repent and believe the truth of the gospel. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want to encourage you, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, Contact us through our Facebook page. Email us. Just connect at fifibc.org. You can email me, Zach, at fifibc.org. We'd love to talk with you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But if you already are a follower of Jesus, understand the words of Luther. Understand what's modeled here in Nehemiah 9. Our lives need to be lives of repentance. Daily going to God. Surrendering picking up our cross and following him. We didn't admit where we fall short. Let people know we need Jesus. I think if we were a little more vulnerable, a little more repentant as a church, that it would really change how we interact with the world around us. Let's share the truth and let's live lives of repentance. Let's go to Lord in prayer this morning. God, we love you. We're so thankful for your word. God, I do pray in these next few moments, Lord, you'd point out anything in our hearts or that we need to repent of. God, that we would be willing to go to you, go to your throne each and every day and repent. God, we pray if there's anyone that is watching this online right now that's never made a decision to follow you, God, we pray that your spirit would be working in their heart even now. God, I pray that we would be a church that confesses sin to one another. God, that we would be a church that prays your word with each other. Lord, we would be a church that worships you in spirit and in truth because you are good you are great, and you are worthy of our worship. We love you, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.